Well, it's a pleasure to be here. I, I did see some of this museum. I mean, unbelievable. It's spectacular. A whole history just in cars. Fantastic. So I'm very pleased to be here. Pleased to see all of you here. And um, the uh, person who's going to be talking to me, I must say, is a man I've known for many, many years. We met in Baltimore 114 years ago, actually. It was a while ago. But he's wonderful, and he works for a great company, and he's uh, uh, in charge of communications. And I found out, it's interesting, I didn't know this at the time, but I'm actually one of the people who actually buys the product from Aegon because one of the p places they, they're involved with is Transamerica, and I have insurance with Transamerica, so I pray every night for Transamerica and Aegon. But he's a great guy, he has a wonderful family. Mr. Greg Tucker. Well, this is nice. Isn't this lovely? Yeah, it's well, great to fantastic. be uh, here in The Hague with you, Mark. You betcha. Yeah. This By the way, I just want to say one thing about cars, because you all saw some of the cars, right? I'll never understand why, truthfully, we changed the designs of certain cars, because you're so uncomfortable in most cars today, and then you see these huge tanks out there, and you say to yourself, what was wrong with that? Global, They're, global warming, Mark. Global, global warming, warming. But, I mean, <laughs> it's just so nice there, so lovely. Well, listen, uh, uh, we're going to talk about your music. We've seen uh, clips right. from, uh, from many of the films that, uh, that uh, we've loved and, uh, of course, have made you famous. But uh, let's, let's just spend a moment talking about where and when right. it all began way back in a place in New York called uh, Juilliard. Juilliard, yes. Yeah, you were a young kid, I think. Right. What happened was my parents came from Vienna, and uh, they came to America, and uh, so... I was about five and a half, six years old, and my sister, who was two years older, was taking piano lessons, but she wasn't doing very well at it. And what I tended to do was to go up to the piano and kind of work out the notes that I had heard her learning and stuff. So everyone said to my father that I had a very good ear, blah, blah, blah. And he, not knowing New York at all, starts going to everybody saying, my son is really talented. What's the best school? What's the best school? Best school? And of course, he gets back the word Juilliard, Juilliard, Juilliard. So you have to understand, I was never somebody who loved the classical music. This was not my thing at six years old. My thing, as you know, still is the New York Yankees, who are playing tonight and leading 3 nothing. However, <laughs> thank God, right. Uh, on the other hand, it's A.J. Burnett. Is, uh, anything could happen. So, uh, so anyway, what happened was, so he said, Julia, Julia, Julia. Now, what did I play at the age of six and a half? I played songs that were hit songs on the radio. Like the number one song at the time was Goodnight Irene. So Goodnight Irene was number one. I could play the song. So my father schedules me to have an audition at Juilliard at the age of six and a half. And at Juilliard, there was this thing called the preparatory division because people think it's just a college, but there is a preparatory division. So I go uh, to, this, uh, to this examination. Now, you have to understand about this examination that the way the examination works is there's three people in a room, and you walk in and you write down what you're going to play, and basically they always ask you to play the most difficult part of whatever you're going to play. Now, I walk in and I play Good Night, Irene. These people are expecting Chopin, Beethoven, Bach, and I play Good Night, Irene. And the man says to me, and now what are you going to do? I said, well, I said, I can play Goodnight Irene in any key. <laughs> and I, I started to do that. I started to play, you know. Now, you have to understand about Juilliard that they had a really interesting choice here to make. They could either say, forget it, kid, because you're out of the, you know, you're not in the sphere that we want. Or they say, well, you know, we would take a chance on this kid because he obviously has a very good ear. He can play these songs in any key. Let's see what we can do. And that's what they did. I mean, they really backed me up. Um, and the story I want to tell you about that backing up has to do with the fact that as I started learning the great masters and everything, my biggest problem was that I got so nervous at these auditions that I used to throw up all the time. I knew, I knew where every bathroom was in the Juilliard School <laughs> because... I had left my mark in every one of them. So, and the other thing was that, that the examination always came around my birthday. I'm born on Ju June 2nd. And, you know, the, 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 the exam would have come either the end of May or just the early part of June, which used to drive me crazy for my birthday because I couldn't enjoy the birthday because you're worried about going for the audition. 
And the reason the, the, the test was important was because that's how you knew if you were going to keep your scholarship or not. And my parents weren't that wealthy, so I mean, I really needed a scholarship. So the one that I remember the most was this audition that I was supposed to do. I was about 11 years old. And my father said, you know, Marvin, maybe the mistake we're making is we're getting there right at the right time. You know, we're, if the audition is 2.30, we get there 2.15. He said, we should get there much earlier. We should get there early enough so that you could really relax, enjoy yourself, calm down. You won't throw up. You'll be fine. Everything will be fine. So we left for this thing at 1 o'clock in the afternoon for 2.30. And you get to Juilliard, it takes about 15 minutes. Then you walk around the, you know, the, the places, and there was a store in there called Shermer's where you could buy really good pencils and stuff. So it was it's taking up, and it's about a quarter to two, but I haven't thrown up. I've been really good. I've been nice. And my father says, you know, it's such a beautiful day. We should go down upstairs to the sixth floor, the roof. Beautiful. We can see everything, you know. So we go up to the sixth floor of the roof, and I see in front of me... Um, the uh, famous uh, Grant's Tomb, which is right up there. You know, Juilliard now is at Lincoln Center, but it used to be 122nd Street and Broadway. And on 122nd Street and Broadway, you can see Grant's Tomb. And I, for, as a youngster, thought that Grant was a kid who didn't do well at Juilliard, and they killed him, and they just <laughs> sat him up there, you know what I mean? I thought he was a former student. Who knew, you know what I mean? So now it's like we look around, it's a quarter after, and we think to ourselves, now it's good. Now we're going to just go down there, hand them the thing, I'm going to play my Bach, I'll be fine. Now, what had happened? Well, two things had happened. Uh, the first thing is, as I go to the door of the sixth floor, the you know, top floor, the door is locked. The door has locked from the outside. You can go in from the inside, you can't go out from the outside. And there I am, supposedly going to be Mr. Cool, about to now go crazy because I'm yelling down six floors, help me, help me, help me. You know what I mean? That's number one. Finally, that problem got uh, straightened out where somebody heard me and came up. But the second problem was that my mother in December, it was December before, had bought the suit for me for this particular thing. And she had bought, in December, a gray pinstripe wool suit. We are in June. We are in June. It's in New York. It's like 91 degrees. And I'm dying. And I had told my mother, I cannot play this piece of music. In this. It's driving me crazy. It's itching. It's hot. So, very quickly, my mother said, well, look, I can't put in a lining now. It's too late. But what I can do is you can put your pajamas on. <laughs> and if you have your pajamas on, you'll be able not it won't itch you so much. It's cotton. It'll be fine. So I go down there. And you know, when you, when you have to do a, 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 a presentation at Juilliard, I always say that you have to make it look difficult. So you come there in Juilliard, and you go, You have to do all that to make it, you know, worthwhile, you know? And as I'm doing that, the three judges start laughing. And I'm thinking to myself, I haven't even played a note. And they're, and they're laughing at me, you know? And the reason, the reason they were laughing is because as I had gotten pacing back and forth upstairs is that slowly but surely the pajamas started showing underneath <laughs> the pants. So uh, it was a very interesting. It was a very interesting tenth year, is all I can tell you. But so, we we did get the scholarship, and we kept going. And I went to Juilliard from the age of six and a half to the age of twenty-one. And what was great about it for me, even though it was very tough, but what was great about it is the one thing Juilliard does, no matter what your instrument or what you want to do, is they make a full rounded, raring to roll, you know, uh, musician, which allows me in my later life to do things that I never even thought I'd ever do, but I was ready for it, whether it's conducting, arranging, playing, well, it didn't matter. Uh, and that's, for that, I'm always very thrilled. Uh, the, the other nice thing that happened with Juilliard was when I won all these prizes, I never heard a word from Juilliard, even though in my biography, no matter what, I always put in the word Juilliard. And only about 10, 12 years ago, the new head of Juilliard called me up and was very respectful and very sweet, and then we had a wonderful rapport and I've even given some classes at Juilliard, which I can't believe that I would do, but, you know, what the heck. And, uh, not, not in the pajamas. Not on the pajamas, no, the pajamas no, 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 no. No, but everybody, if you're in theater or music and uh, 
insurance, uh, you look for that big break. Right. Um, yeah. And right. Uh, uh, so uh, what, what was it? Of course, so, Juilliard was right. a big break. Right. But so what happens is my, my schooling was either public school, which is PS9, then to a very wonderful, very unique school called Professional Children's School, very much like if you saw the movie Fame, you know, one of those schools. I always say, you know, these were the kids in the school that were on Broadway on television shows. I used to say about the school, it's the only school you know when you walk up to the kid and say, hi, what's your name? He says, ask my agent. You know what I mean? <laughs> very, <laughs> very professional. Um, and then I went to Queens College. So I was going to Queens College and Juilliard. I was doing all that stuff. Now, one of the first jobs that I got in my life was to be the rehearsal pianist on a show called um, Funny Girl with Barbara Streisand. That was my first job. In order to pull off that job, and I was going to college, I had to say to my father, he really made me do this, that I would have to take off a term of, of college, and no matter what happened in my life, I would return to college. That was like, that's the bargain. Otherwise, you can't do this, this thing. So that was the bargain that I struck, and by the way, I did, you know, I was good to my word. So I took this one semester off, and I'm doing Funny Girl, and I'm feeling great. Now, my job, to be exact about it, was this. Barbara Streisand had a pianist. His name was Peter. Anything she sang alone, solo, he played. But anything she sang with anybody else, or if anybody else sang, I played. So most of the time, I'm at the piano, because you know, she has a certain amount of songs alone, and then the rest of them are with the cast, usually. So that's my job. It's a very fantastic job. I'm having a great time, and I'm like in the part of the business I want, which is show. I want to be on Broadway, is all I keep thinking. So it's a certain night, whatever, and Peter Daniels uh, calls me up. This is a fateful moment, and I'll tell you why. He calls me up and says that a woman has called him to play a party that night because the man who r runs this party, who gives a party every Saturday night, always used to have records and tapes playing in the background, but has now bought a piano and has forgotten that they need a piano player. And he has said no to her and has said, given my number to her, as if I'm going to say yes. So she calls me up and she tells me the story about blah, 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 and I said, we need a pianist. I said, lady, please. I you know, I'm a pianist, I've been playing with Funny Girl, I, I just don't do this. I said, but if you tell me who the party's for, perhaps I could send somebody over. And she says, it's for the Hollywood producer Sam Spiegel. Sam Spiegel had just done On the Waterfront and Lawrence of Arabia. I said, I'll be over in 10 minutes. <laughs> and parenthetically, I thought to myself, I'm not Jewish for a hobby. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> And what happened was what <laughs> what happened was that this is this is a philosophy of mine that really took hold when this situation occurred, and I, this is what I really believe. I believe that every person in life gets one major opportunity, and the the two requisites for that are one you have to know this is it this is it this is important, and two you have to be ready for it. For instance, when I heard. Sam Spiegel's name, I went, the chances of me having a shot at being in a room with a Hollywood producer in New York City at a major party and me being there is a billion to one. So if that comes up, I'm going for it. And number two, it gives you the opportunity to possibly do something. And a lot of people I know, uh, in fact, my sister uh, was a victim of this. My sister was asked sometime to do something and she would say something like, well, you know, I'm not really ready. I didn't take a course. I did it. Um, call me back in six months. You never get the call back. The, the, they don't call again. It's a one shot. So at that moment, I get my trusty tuxedo and I go to Sam Spiegel's home and I play this party. I'm literally playing just background music. I'm not trying. However, you can imagine the difference of these people who are there who are now having music played for them, anything they want, as opposed to having a record. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm telling you, famous people are there. They're asking, and so they're telling him, this was the greatest party because if Bobby Kennedy wants to hear something, I'll play it. You know what I mean? Uh, Faye Dunaway was there. She wants to hear something, I'll play it. It doesn't matter what you play, whatever, I'm ready. So, so what happens is, when the party's over, he says to me, and remember, he was Viennese also, so we had a lot of things that we could talk about. He says that he's working on a new film. It's by John Cheever. It's a short story, and he's looking 
for a new composer because he gave a big break to uh, Leonard Bernstein to do uh, uh, On the Waterfront. That was a Sam Spiegel film. So I go out, I buy the book, and I read the book, the short story really, and I call him back because I now have his phone number in my, you know, my Rolodex here, and I say to him, Mr. Spiegel, I just want you to know I read this uh, book, and I want you to know I think I've written a terrific theme for your film. And he says, well, come on over. So I come over, I play this theme, and I'm not kidding you, on that night, Sam Spiegel probably, after I played it for him three times and he really loved it, he started calling people. And they would show up at his apartment, you know, and I'd have to play it for them. I told him one time, I said, you know, if, if this song was played as many times on the radio, as many times as I played it tonight, it'd be a smash, you know what I mean? So the next thing you know is he offers me a job to go to California and to do this film. And as I say, I wasn't really worried about doing the film because I had told him, yeah, I could do it. Because once I get the job, I figure out how to do it. You know, I don't have to figure it out until I have to do it. And then when I do it, I go to people that I know and get all the advice I can and find the right people. So what worried me was not the doing the job. What worried me was the, the air, the air uh, going by air, because I'd never flown. So I was so nervous about flying that I took a train from New York to Los Angeles, which is 60 hours. <laughs> and as I say to people, if you ever had a fear of flying, the easiest way to get over it is to take a train from New York to Los Angeles. <laughs> So I thought it might be nice for you all to hear this, this theme. And um, the whole world of uh, movies then opened to me once I had done this uh, film. How many of you saw The Swimmer, by the way? Right. You can see why my career took a while to get going. <laughs> Three, three days you wrote this, right? I mean, how long did it take? It, 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 uh, no, it took yeah. about a couple of days. A couple of days. You know, couple of but, days. but then I went out to Hollywood and uh, yeah. had a nice uh, time out there. And it was out there long enough to figure out kind of like what the movie business was like. And because of the fact that no one was calling me to do a show, I basically stayed out there for quite a while. Well, that's, uh, I want to move on to that because you, uh, you're, you're known as much as a, as a film right. writer, a music, a musician as, as, uh, for theater, for, for Broadway. Right. How did... Uh, so Sam Spiegel gets you started, of right. course. You're out there. And then, of course, as uh, we saw from Miss Streisand, you, uh, your career really took off uh, yes. with, a, with a particular show called right. The Way We Were. How did that uh, You know, You know that 
that uh, show called Six Degrees of Separation. In a way, that's really part of my life because what I, what I found out, it took a while to figure this out, but the relationships that you make with people sometimes is, is the thing that keeps things happening in your life because you just connect with certain people. So, for instance, when I did the uh, A Funny Girl, it was produced by a man by the name of Ray Stark. Ray Stark was a huge producer of Hollywood films. I think when it comes to Broadway, I think probably the, the way we were may be the only pr show he ever produced. But in films, he was huge. Uh, when I did the dance music for a film called, for, a, for a, a show called Henry Sweet Henry, the director of, the, of that show was George Roy Hill, who then did the sting, and the choreographer of that show was a fellow by the name of Michael Bennett, who then later on did a chorus line. So all of these little things uh, mean a lot. So the way I got the way we were, though, is a very interesting story because it shows you the mentality, unfortunately or fortunately, of producers. Um, I was brought up in a very European household, very Viennese, very, you know, you know, um, certain, my, my father was a person who really believed in the rules. The rules were everything. My mother, not so much, but my father, yeah. Anyway, so my father also believed very much that if you actually did good work, really good work, that that would somehow pay itself off somewhere along the way. So Ray Stark calls me to tell me that he's doing a film called Fat City. Now, let me just tell you right now, if you haven't seen Fat City, you're a very lucky person. It's not a very good movie, and it was directed by John Huston. I may have one of the worst films that I ever did with John Huston, but to be honest with you, John Huston was already gone from this film. The director wasn't even there to tell me what he wanted. It was like unbelievable. So what did they want? Very simple. They want me to go to Nashville, record, whether it's old music or new music, meaning I could write it, I could have somebody else write it, it doesn't matter, just record uh, about 20 minutes of, you know, country music. And then you're on a certain budget, they give me the pieces of paper for, you know, that everyone has to sign how much the money costs. And then I come back to Hollywood and I show them the 20 minutes, right? So this is exactly what I do. I go down there, I pick some really great musicians, we go in a studio, we start recording. It takes about six, seven hours, you get 20 minutes of music, you're all happy, everyone's happy. When I come back to California, I go to Hollywood, I go up to uh, Ray Stark's office, and there's Ray Stark. And under this hand, I have the tapes. I have all the stuff, all the recordings. Those days it was all on tape, so it was a lot of things. And in this hand, I have all of the things that have been, you know, uh, requisitioned and everything that's been, that everything's cost, and I have the number. And it turns out I come in $8,000 less than what they were going to expend. They were thrilled to have 8000 They saved $8,000, right? And Ray Stark, without having heard anything from here, hasn't even put in the, hasn't even taken the tape, says, you came in $8,000 less? I said, yes, I did. There's this other film I've got called The Way We Were. <laughs> I mean, talk about, you know, I mean, you want, you want the story to go, he heard my music and fell in love with it so much and said, you're my man. But no, 8,000 cheaper, you got the job, you know what I mean? <laughs> so, um, so then what happened was, again, getting yourself ready for certain things. I knew that Alan and Marilyn Bergman were the people who normally write for Barbara Streisand. So the first thing I do is I call and find out the phone number of Alan and Marilyn Bergman. Now, Quincy Jones, again, all these things have a way of coming together. Quincy Jones had recorded, when he was the head of a certain a record company, he recorded a song of mine called Sunshine, Lollipops, and Rainbows with Leslie Gore. And so I had his number in my Rolodex, and I called him, and he gave me the number of the Bergmans. But he also t said to me, well, if you're going to do a movie, he said, you better get, and then he gave me the names of these two orchestrators. He said, these guys have done hundreds of movies, they can really do it great, blah, 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 blah. So I had them kind of in my corner, and then we wrote the song. Now, when we wrote the song, I was really thrilled. I was totally happy. And then what's very funny is you go to the home of Barbara Streisand, and three lousy singers are going to show our, 
the way we were. You know what I mean? It's, I've got myself can't sing. I've got Alan and Marilyn Bergman, not exactly the best vocalist. But everything's fine. Everything's fine. And she makes a couple of changes as is her want. And we do the changes. Everything's fine. Except then, for some inexplicable reason, which is still unclear to me, the suggestion came, well, you know, you have months before the film is going to be ready. Why don't you write another song for the hell of it? I was happy that she liked the first one. It was like, I'm happy, I'm happy to quit here, you know. So we wrote another one. And I didn't like the second one as much as I liked the first. So thankfully, the director of the film, Sidney Pollack, did a very smart thing. He had Barbara literally do what we call a scratch track, meaning a track where she's singing, but just with a piano. And we put both of those tracks up against the film. And that's when you really know what you have. It's one thing to play it alone. But when you put it up with the actual images, then there's a visceral thing that happens, which you either like or you don't like, but it starts to work. And uh, the first song won, thank God. But the story I want to tell about the way we were that's the interesting part of this whole thing was that we recorded this thing. We did the whole movie. I was really feeling great about what I'd written. I was in a good mood. I was very proud. And it's very interesting. When you finish a movie, you can't tell anybody. The movie may not come out in five months, and you can't tell anybody. You know, you just kind of, well, hey, what are you doing? Well, well, yeah, you know. I always, say, I always say in California, if you say to somebody you, you're not doing anything, they go, he's out of work. In New York, if you say I'm not doing anything, he says, he's really working on something big. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's just the difference of the coasts, you know? So we finished this picture, and it, it gets previewed, I think, in Denver or Phoenix, one of the two places. And what bothered me about the um, preview was that I felt that we didn't get people crying enough at the end. We just didn't get it. And I was really upset with myself because I thought, I don't know, I, mu I must have made a mistake here because we sh they should be crying, you know? So I go up to these two guys, the names were Leo Shukin and Jack Hayes, these two orchestrators, and I said, guys, you know, you've done over 400 pictures. What did I do wrong? I said, because it's driving me crazy. And they said, well, you know, Marvin, when you do a film and you have a theme song, you might hear it 30 times, but the audience only hears it three times because they're, they're not aware of it 30 times because they're watching a film and they hear all this dialogue, you know? And so you think you may have overused it, but I think you've got to use it more. And the pivotal scene where I thought I was being brilliant was the very end of the film where she touches his hair at the Plaza Hotel. This was the pivotal moment, and I thought, my original version was that I had what I call the second theme, you know, the supporting theme happened there, and then as they all left each other, I had her come in singing the way we were. That was my original concept. So I rewrote it and decided to put the melody now the way we were, melody, on that moment where she touches his head, still have her sing at the end, but at least it'd be the same melody. So I felt very strongly about this, and I wrote it out, and I went to the head of the music department, and he said to me, no, we're not spending another dollar on this thing. Forget it. So then I said to him, kind of like with a real grain, of, you know, like, come on, yo-ho-ho. -ho. I said, you, don't, you must have a film doing a session here that we could just, this whole thing would take me five minutes. You could put me on one of your other movies just to get the five minutes with the orchestra. No. So I did a very daring thing because I really couldn't sleep. I could not stand the fact that I had a better solution and I hadn't been able to get it. So I gave them back $15,000 so I could record this thing on my ticket. Now I'm paying $15,000 for an orchestra that I'm going to use for 10 minutes but you have to pay them for three hours. I mean, it was a heck of a gig, you know what I mean? Good union. But I did have the last laugh because the next preview, there was tears. And when the tears started, I went, it was worth it. And, and I'm very big on that. I do believe that if you get a chance to alter something that you really think is wrong, if you even get that chance, you need to, to stand up and say, this is it, I have to have it. So that was a, uh, and it was a turning point in my life because having the sting and the way we were in the same year set up a great moment for me at the, at the Oscars. Because, I mean, normally, how many, having two great films, having two great films, I mean, The Sting is a perfect film. The Sting is just perfect. The Way We Were is not perfect, but the good news about The Way We Were is it almost doesn't matter because those two people had electricity on that stage, on the, on the screen. It was, 
I mean, I always say the two best love stories I've ever done were Redford and Newman and Redford and Streisand. I mean, because <laughs> it's chemistry. It's chemistry like you can't believe. I mean, that chemistry takes apart all of the things that are bad with the movie. I mean, one of the things that I felt very strongly about in the way we were was that I was going to make it as romantic as was possible because I wasn't a big lover of the other stuff in that movie, particularly the stuff having to do with Hollywood and, and all of the political stuff, which, by the way, from the time that I first saw the film to the time it came out got really much shorter, much less. I mean, it got down to the, the main basics. But what worked in that film was that love story worked fabulously. I mean, and those two people on the screen, they could have said blah, 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 blah. You would have loved them. So, so, so the music does shape the film. I mean, the, 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 There are times in music where I think producers are hoping you can somehow make it better, meaning support it and make it better. I'm not sure if music by itself can ever, quote, save a loser. I mean, that's, that's asking a lot. But a film can, in a comedy, make it feel much quicker. It can, in a, in a, in a, in a uh, what do you call it, in a love story, really get your heartstrings. There's a lot of things it can do. I mean, look at Jaws. I mean, Jaws is the perfect example. You, you know, you hear, ba -da, da -da, and you're you know, like, I don't even go in the bath anymore. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I'm a shower man now, you know what I mean? Well, you've, uh, you've created an uh, irresistible moment for us, so uh, uh, you, you, you're going to have to indulge us here. And to help you, we yes. have a, a, a young rising star yes. uh, here from the Netherlands, who uh, many of you will know uh, from a famously uh, uh, aired uh, competition for Mary Poppins. Uh, she's also appeared in Dirty Dancing, and is, uh, and as well as a number of television uh, uh, programs, and is currently uh, in The Producers. So please give a warm welcome to Norcha. Herlar. Thank you. 
So now, now that you're out here, it's so wonderful. We're going to play an Academy Award loser. You know, I do lose them also, you know. <laughs> uh, and uh, this is a very interesting song because the song that it lost to says the whole thing about this event. Uh, this is Ice Castles, and we lost to Shaft. So there you are. <laughs> It's everything I am, everything I want to be. I can see what's mine now. I can feel so much since I found you looking through the eyes of love. I can take the time I can see my life As it comes up shining now Reaching out to touch you I can feel so much Since I found you Looking through the eyes of again and I want to remember how it feels to touch you how I feel so much since I found you looking through the eyes of Thank you. Now, now even the non-musicians in the room will, uh, will surely know, Marvin, that uh, there, there's a unique sound. There's a certain sound to your music that's similar. I mean, Gershwin, you can tell a Gershwin song. Right. Like you didn't write Chaff, for instance. You know, <laughs> so uh, is, how, do you think you have a, is there a Hamlish sound? Is there a unique uh, uh, style? I'm very much, I very much care about melody which these days is almost, uh, I, I would say, at the, at the brink of being ultra old fashioned. I still believe that uh, a melody is what it's about. Uh, right now we're in a very rhythm oriented world as opposed to, you know, everything starts with uh, and I start with <laughs> yeah, I mean, I just hear the melody, but, I, but that's probably because that's what I grew up on. You know, that's what I remember. That's what I feel strongest about. Um, so, I mean, if there's such thing, I mean, I pride myself in being somewhat different in terms of my sound for certain films. I mean, I think if you looked at what you saw before, I think what I did for, uh, for uh, Take the Money and Run is wildly different than the score. I mean, the Bond score was as about as uh, more rock and roll and more into a whole other world. I mean, I try to immerse myself in what the film particularly needs, you know? Well, let's talk about a little bit what you're doing today. You, uh, you uh, did The Informant uh, last year that came right. out with Matt Damon. Right, Matt yeah. Damon film. A very interesting film because um, it was one of the few films in my life that I really did not write a note for the first two weeks. I could not come up with anything that I thought was really good. And one day I'm walking on the streets and I realized that the guy in the film is bipolar. So that means that what's white is black, what's up is down, what's right is wrong. And then I decided to write the whole score literally like a schizophrenic would, meaning trying to figure out what was going on in his mind, which is totally different than everybody else perceives it. And I remember calling the director and said, you better come over here. I said, because 
if I write this, and I commit to this, I just want you to know what you're in for, and I just want to see, you know, and Steven Soderbergh really liked it, so I was very happy with that. And uh, I'm now um, working on a show for, in New York for uh, DreamWorks, which I'm very excited about, because um, that's, that's really where my heart is. My heart is usually in, in the theater. And for film, there's a film that's going to be coming out. It hasn't been done yet, but we're looking forward to it, which is about an incident in the life of uh, Liberace. It's not the Liberace story, but it's about a very specific incident. And um, I'll be uh, writing the music for that. Great, great. And well, by the way, I <coughs> met Liberace years ago in Vegas. I can only say to you that if ever there was a man who did not have a mean streak at all, one of the sweetest people you ever met in your life, and so uncompetitive, it, it was ridiculous, is Liberace. And the thing about Liberace that's so great is that if you were to buy a Liberace record and you just closed your eyes, you didn't look, you didn't look at the cover, you didn't, you, you didn't see the mink coat, nothing. The playing is unbelievable. I mean, I'm thinking about literally having to overdub most of the piano in this stuff because nobody can actually play what he actually played. I mean, he's the Lang Lang of Pops. Yeah. You know what I mean? He really is. It's, it's unbelievable what he could do. So uh, to get that sound is a, is a whole other thing. Well, you, uh, do you think uh, when you come to a song, of course, you, you, know, you, you, have, to, you have to have an idea? And, uh, well, actually, it started with the way we were. What, yeah. what was interesting is the way we were, a lot of people think that a lyricist wrote the title. There, was no, there, there wasn't a professional lyricist who wrote the title. The way we were is the title of a book by Arthur Lawrence, made into a movie, sent on to uh, the Bergmans who put in all the other words. But the title, the way we were, was, in fact, the, t the title of a book. And that's when I realized there are people in this world, regular people, normal people, who have titles in their head. And if they had a composer around, well, they could write, you know. You know, I, I don't want to take you up on that, no, but, but uh, I'm going to take you up on it. Absolutely, sure. We, uh, we might have a few composers, well, of, uh, ideas here. Uh, right, exactly. And, and, and we've got a composer. As long as it's an original idea, because sometimes you give out these rules, someone calls out T for three. This is not original. Yeah, yeah right. Can we bring the house lights up just a little bit? Now, this is the uh, audience participation moment yes, here. Yes, right. So what we want you to do is think about anything. Brand new. A, brand new, a title, right. words, Holler it out, put your hand up, and then we'll, we'll holler it out, anything. And let's see if right. uh, Marvin can put it to music. Now, be creative here. Come on. Wow, uh, in the back. Way in the back here. Two skinny people hugging. Two skinny people hugging. This is not Stump the Band. Yeah. This is a... <laughs> but it's a good time. We'll hold on to that. Hold we'll on just... to it, okay. Yeah. Hold on. Another idea. There's a lady up here. Yeah. Yes. A private, private man. man. Two skinny people hugging a private man. <laughs> hugging the private man? No. <laughs> if you know this and want to hum along. So they asked me what I'm going to do tomorrow. What I'm going to do tomorrow, I cannot say Because I'm a private man And I do the best I can But I'm a private man But I'll tell you about what I did last Sunday night And I'll tell you and I bet you know it It's alright I saw two people hugging On the street And I said I gotta meet Those crazy folks Oh yes it's true But that's all you're gonna get from me That's all you can because, my friends, I'm a private man. A private man. Private man. All right. Well, well while we have the house lights up, let's, uh, let's uh, turn it over to your questions. Do we have some questions here? Anything that uh, has occurred to you in, uh, so far this evening? Yes, here. The score you wish you had oh. written. Oh. 
Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, you mean a score that I love so much? Oh, yeah. Well, uh, 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 what do you call it? Hold on. It'll be there. It, what? <laughs> no, 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 no. Are you talking about in the movie? In the movie? Um, the, uh, um, hold on. It's, it's, a, it's the French film. It's the great film. Uh, what's the name of it? Uh, Cinema, Cinema Paradiso. Yeah, that's the one. That's the one. You know, it's an interesting, it's a fantastic score. And it's so great that um, even just hearing the music alone is, is, is a great experience. I love that film. But I love that music is to drop dead die. Which is unfortunate because you'd like to live while you heard it. But, uh, <laughs> but it, no, it's that, that's the one. I mean, that's really wonderful. They're just wonderful stuff. Great. Okay. Is, there, is there another? I thought I saw him. Yes, right here. Um, what would you say you prefer as um, composing just a pure score or composing songs for score? Well, unfortunately, and that's a very good question. Unfortunately, there's a whole thing that comes with writing the song as opposed to writing the score. And I'm being very honest now. This is not the kind of answer I would give to the Hollywood press because I would get killed for it. But from an ego standpoint, from just a pure ego standpoint, when you write a song and it becomes a hit, that is what we would call real fire in your career. That's something that just ignites a whole lot of stuff. You know, there are some great scores that have been written, great scores that no one's ever heard of. Because if the film dies, the score dies. And then there are some great scores in great films that you know, come out, and still no one's heard them. Um, so what usually gets nominated at the end of the year are usually scores from major motion pictures, okay? But, but if you wrote the, the, if you wrote just the song from Titanic, more people know you from that than know who wrote the score of Titanic, if you know what I'm saying. So the thing about film is that the good thing about film is, yes, if you can immerse yourself in the score and you're happy with it because you really like it and that's it, fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Because the great thing about working in film is they pay you. They pay you if the, if the, if the, show, if the movie is a hit or a bomb. You get paid. That's not, the tr that's not what happens on Broadway. Broadway, you kill yourself for two years, you write it, it comes out, it's a bomb, you got nothing. You, you, you still you have nothing, zero. You had nothing going in, it's a bomb, you have nothing going out. But when you have a hit song, like, when you have a hit song, it is kind of like, um, it's, another, it's just another lane, but it's a very hot lane. It's like, a, it's like that stardom that you get, which only me last three years, but boy, for three years, what a parlay, you know what I mean? So, so in my opinion, and this may have hurt me in my career, but in my opinion, yes, I really try to look for a film that has a song. You know, I, 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 I just think that's more up my alley. Now, if you had said to me, well, you could have written the music for Schindler's List and there's no song, believe me, I would have written the, the, the music for Schindler's List, no question. But most of the time in your career, you don't get five great movies. You're thrilled if you get two great movies. I mean, you know, you don't get five. You know, it's very hard. So, uh, yeah, that, that's really the difference between the two. Okay, one more. Yes. Yes, sir. Let me ask you, when you're composing, what's going on in your head? Do you just hear music, melody, or do you right. see visuals or pictures right. or a combination? So the question is, what, what's going on in my head when I'm writing? Early on in my career, early on, uh, I started writing a lot of songs, just for the heck of it, right? And I started to collect a, a, a small body of work on my piano, right? The slow, you know. And then I read the obituary of uh, Steve Allen. Now, does Steve Allen mean anything here? Okay. Steve Allen was this absolutely fantastic uh, television personality. He was funny as anything, but was a very good composer and a very good pianist, okay? And in reading the obituary, it said something like he had had 990 songs published. 990 songs published, which only two does anybody know. I mean, there's only two that anyone would know. You know, you're walking along the street and having a party. Da 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 da. He wrote that, and he wrote another one. 
called South, uh, South Rampart Street Parade, he wrote, okay? So I thought to myself, you know, there is something crazy about writing 998 songs of which the public only knows two. Because the thing about the public that I don't think they even understand is, you actually control my career. I write a song that I think is crap, you like it, everybody's happy. I write a song that's great, you don't like it, I'm unhappy, right? I write a song that I really think is good and you like it, now we're all happy. But the people who, who decide which way the song is going has nothing to do with me. It has to do with what the public thinks, right? So at an early point in my career, I went, you know, it's not really worth writing just songs for the heck of it, where you're just, you know, knocking on the doors of people and saying, could you sing this? Could you do it's like It's like, first of all, it's very demeaning for me to have to go, I'm not good at this. Hello, hello, I'm begging you to sing this song. They say no. And then you have to live with yourself and go, no, it's rejection. This is not good. So what I decided to do was to become a gun for hire, meaning you hire me, I know it's going to be used. I know this thing is going to have its day. You're either hiring me for a film or for a, a, a Broadway show, but there comes a book with it, there comes an idea with it, there come actors with it. So my life has been about not so much a tons of stuff, just a small amount, but stuff that gets out there. So, you know, Chorus Line was a show, it gets out there. Um, they're playing our song was a show, it gets out there. That doesn't mean I haven't had bombs too. I had a huge bomb in London years ago called Gene Seberg, a show that I loved, but it was a bomb. So, but at least you know it has its day in court. So, no, I don't walk around the whole day going, with a song in my heart, no, I don't know. <laughs> but I'm very quick once I get the assignment. Once I get the assignment, what happens normally is that I immerse myself I immerse myself in that story. And then I try to get into the mind of the, the, uh, the, the protagonist of the story. And then I start thinking about what's the most interesting way to go about this. Um, and s that's how it starts to you know, come around. Uh, and what really, I will tell you one piece of advice that I think is very true. If it's 10 o'clock at night and you're writing something, right? and it's 11 o'clock at night, and you like it, you put it on tape, you go, okay, I got it, right? At 11 o'clock at night, you think it's the greatest piece of music you ever wrote. Now you have to go to sleep. If you wake up at 10 o'clock the next morning and still like it, you have something. But if you don't like it at 10 o'clock in the morning, which happens most of the time, you go, another day, shot. Um, so you, you, you tend to, be, you, the thing about it is that with a movie, what you're trying to do is support the movie the best you can. And that's really the, the bottom line. In a show, it's different because you're really you you are the person that is making these songs come alive. You know what I mean? But but that's how I try to do it. I try to get myself totally immersed. My only pet peeve of movies that I can't stand uh, is, and this happens in America much more than it happens in Europe. I kind of like the way they do European films better in terms of the music. But in a, in, a, in America, what'll happen is it'll start. A film will start, and it says. 1836 Budapest, and you'll hear, baby, baby, I'm in Budapest and I love you. <laughs> and you go like, in their attempt to have another hit song, they will throw anything in, doesn't matter the time, doesn't matter the place, doesn't matter the context, that's it, you know? And I can't stand that, that drives me crazy. I want it to be, if it's 1836 Budapest, I want it to sound like 1836. That's about it, you know? Let me uh, turn, you can bring the lights back. Um, the, um we're often asked to, uh, in, in, in uh, business world, right. or corporate world, to, to think out of the box. box right. but, uh, but of course, you, uh, at one point in your career, were actually, literally, in had to think in the box. Right. Tell us this, the story. This is the, uh, the chorus line uh, story. I got this phone call from Michael Bennett about doing a show, and all he knew about the show was that he thought it was about dancers, period, the end, that was it. That's what we started with on day one. I left all my stuff in California, zoomed to New York, and started working on the show. And I did not have, I didn't have an apartment in New York. So I came to New York and found an apartment, which was an apartment on a very beautiful block in New York, beautiful. What I didn't realize was this was a new apartment building, and they make the apartment buildings in New York paper-thin walls. And within a day or two, a woman kept calling my phone and saying, could you stop that crap? And I would say to her, it's not that I won't stop, but could you call it music? I said, because I'm really doing my best here, you know? <laughs> and uh, 
So I called up an architect and said, what can I do to, because this woman's going to drive me crazy. And they actually built in this apartment a little box, a box, because I was working on an upright piano, not this big, an upright. So we had this box. We put the upright into the box. The box was about a foot off the floor, so it wouldn't make any kind of uh, vibrations. And most of the score, of course, I was written in a box. Um, and uh, the only thing that I think is really important about Chorus Line that I really want to say, because I really believe this very much, because anything that I tell you has come out of my own experience, so that's why I can believe in it. But when I gave up having just won three Oscars, when I gave up that career to go to New York and dash any hopes of getting the next big picture, because I'm going to go out of the, 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 that world for a while, the reason I did it was simply because this was my passion that I wanted to do, and here's the guy that I'm crazy about offering me a job. Not offering it to Stephen Sondheim, offering it to me. And uh, he had just worked with Stephen Sondheim, so it seemed unbelievable to me that he would hire me. Uh, and I think in life, whether it was a hit or a bomb, because people think I say this because it was a hit, but it could have been a bomb, if you get an opportunity to really follow your heart, absolutely follow your heart, I don't care what, you do it. Because the worst death I can think of, the worst, is on your deathbed saying, if only I had, fill in the words, you know? And so to me, I would have, my whole life, I would have been so depressed if I had not, if I, because I could have said to Michael, Michael, you're a little late, you know? I got three movies coming up, I got this, that, that. I'm the hottest guy in, in Hollywood, enjoy yourself, you know? But this was the this was it this was the the manna from heaven and I wasn't gonna gonna say no. Um and the thing about Chorus Line was that when we were working on it, we did three workshops on that show over the year and a half and nobody thought it was gonna be this big hit. Nobody. I mean I love when people talk to me now about it like we knew. We had no idea, you know? We were just trying to do a good different show. That's all we were trying to do. Just Change, change the whole thing up there, you know? No big star, no big set, no big costumes, no big orchestra, you know? Just try to do something new. Um, but I had so much belief in um, Michael Bennett that, you know, I just thought, you know, he could, he could lead me to a minefield and I would have gone. You know, I was really into it. Um, and it was a great experience. And um, on the opening night, on the opening night, Michael said to me, I said to him, what do you think if we made a mistake and this thing's going to get killed? And he said, do you think you did a good job? I said, yes. He said, do you think you wasted any time? I said, no. He said, then you've done all you can do. So there we are, are at Sardi's. The show has opened. I'm waiting for the newspaper at New York Times. And the New York Times at those days was next to Sardi's. So I walked over to the New York Times. First paragraph, brilliant. Second paragraph, brilliant. Gets to the fifth paragraph. This is something I will remember till my death. The music by Marvin Hamlish, parenthesis, this time without the help of Scott Joplin. <laughs> and then death, pure death. It just, this is like, like horrible. So after I threw up, <laughs> I went to Juilliard, figured why not, you know? So I, after I threw up, I was totally depressed to the point that I was, in, I was in bed for like three days after that. Here's the biggest show on Broadway and I'm like, can't even move. And I kept thinking to myself, if I go downstairs for a taxi, the taxi driver is going to be doing like this, look at me and say, you're the one that got that bad review. Get out of my cab. You know what I mean? So uh, what happened was that uh, two things happened to get me out of the funk because it was really bad. One was a dear friend of mine sent me a book uh, about the worst reviews ever written for composers, but starting from classical composers, worst review that Beethoven ever got, that George Gershwin ever got, that Bach ever got. And I said, boy, I'm in good company. I'm really, you know. <laughs> and the second thing that happened, which was for me a godsend, was that the show opened on a Wednesday or a Thursday. But by Sunday, we got the Sunday review in the New York Times, which was written by Walter Kerr. And he was the dean of, of all the writers in, the, in, in, in Broadway. And he loved the show, and he loved the score. He called the score perfect. So I called Michael Bennett and I said, Michael, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I said, you've got to let me call Walter Kerr because I've got to thank him for this. I said, because he's, he's kept me from you know, putting the, the, you know, the bullet in the barrel. You know? <laughs> and I called him. I called Walter Kerr. I said, you have saved my life. 
She because I have not been able to walk outside for four days. I have just been totally, I mean, I'm, not, I'm talking about no hunger, no this, no that. Just give me another pill. Just give me anything, you know what I mean? And, uh, and then Chorus Line became this, this thing that was like off and running. And uh, um, it was just something to... And still running. No, no, no. That, well, well, it's all, all around the world. Yeah. I want to just tell one fast story because I know that we have to finish this up. But I want to tell one story about Chorus Line that I, that I love. And again, from my own experience, this is something you'll, you'll never realize. But So Chorus Line is coming to the last of its previews. We had like 10 previews. And I have to be honest with you, the applause at the end wasn't like anything that it became. I mean, it became huge at the end. We were doing the same ending except for one difference, and it was getting okay applause. And no one could fix it. Nobody. I mean, Michael Bennett had no idea what was wrong. I had no idea what was wrong. The book writer had no idea. Uh, Joe Papp, a brilliant, brilliant producer, had no idea. And we're saying to ourselves, I can't believe we're doing this incredible bows, this fantastic dance, and we're getting... <laughs> so who comes to the show? So on about the fourth, fifth preview, Marsha Mason, who was then married to Neil Simon, comes to the show. Marsha Mason, right? And when it's over, she says, I have to see Michael, because Marsha had done a show with, with Michael. And she says to Michael, no, uh, one of them, yeah, I think it could have been, but it was definitely she did a show with him. So she, she says, Michael, I think I know what's wrong with the show. He said, well, tell me, because I have no idea. He said, she said, well, you know, in the end of the show, when they're giving out the jobs, the person who did not get the job during that part of the show was Cassie. And she said, you know, you can't do that to an audience. She said, because we know that Cassie's the best person up there. We know she's the most qualified, if not overqualified. And no director worth his salt would turn down the best person just because she didn't love him or didn't, you know, their, their, you know, their, their love affair didn't work out. Because it was very personal, actually, with Michael. Because Michael had been married to Donna McKechnie in real life. So he was using this ending of this thing to almost take care of his own psychological problems. <laughs> so for the hell of it, for the hell of it that night, the next day, Michael changed the ending and just had her get the job. That was a one second change. You know, you're gonna, you're gonna win, you're gonna lose. Next. I swear to God, from that day on, that show was like uh, incredible. And it was, I remembered saying to someone, I said, you know what this reminds me of? If you buy a 35 millimeter camera and you by yourself do the focus, you know, the distance between unfocused and focus is literally, uh, it's that, uh, and you're in focus. That's what life is all about. I think that whole thing that happened with Donna McKechnie and that whole situation taught me a life's lesson that sometimes you're that close to it. You're that close to the solution. You're that close to the, the thing, and you're killing yourself all over the place, and you have to just go, mm. and, you know, and that's a very important lesson that I learned, because sometimes it's a note, sometimes it's the way you play it, sometimes it's a key, sometimes it's a feeling. It just is, but you know that you're closing in on it. You know? So it was a great, great lesson. Well, again, you've whetted our appetite, and okay, uh, what yes. do you say you give us some music from Chorus Absolutely, line? and I want to say this has been a lovely, Lovely evening, I must say. I, I, for those of you who, who had a... <laughs> thank, you. thank you. And for those of you who have a chance still to see part of this museum, my lord, whoa, man. And I, you know, you, you, Mr. Lauman's available afterwards for private tours, everybody. So well, I will tell you one thing, though. <laughs> probably gas during those years probably cost, what, a nickel? You know? I mean, come on. You know, give me a break here. Okay. The there's chorus line. Like, there's nothing like going to the, to the uh, gas station and paying $100 for gas. I mean, come on. And then three minutes later, you're back. I mean, it's not... <laughs> You know, the man asked me about how do you uh, write the thing or what do you immerse yourself with? So here's a very good example. One. How did we get to one? Well, one... The lyricist came up with the title One, the idea is that we're all in it together. Michael said to me, before I got to playing anything, he said, I must have this. So when I sat down, I already had <laughs> blah, blah. So that's how the song gets written. You, it becomes part of what you need.
kiss today goodbye The sweetness and the sorrow Wish me luck the same to you But I can't regret what I did for love What I did for I would just like to offer some thank yous on behalf of the John Adams Institute. Uh, first of all, Greg Tucker, thank you for uh, expertly conducting this interview with Mr. Hamlish. But beyond that, uh, the John Adams Institute works with other partners to bring uh, speakers to the Netherlands. If I had called Marvin Hamlish and asked him to, to come, uh, he wouldn't have, I, I think, taken the call. It's because uh, Greg Tucker asked him that he came. So thank you very much for Greg and for all that you do. Norcha Herlar, thank you very much. It was uh, spectacular, your contribution. <laughs> to our friends and sponsors of the Institute, most of whom are here tonight, 
both current and soon to be. Thank you all very much for your support. A special thanks to Aegon, to the Binger Film Lab, to the Laumann Museum for this remarkable space, to our uh, steady supporters, the Holland America Friendship Foundation and the U.S. Embassy. Upcoming John Adams Institute events, September 28th, Isabel Wilkerson, who recently won the Pulitzer Prize for her mammoth book about the great migration of blacks in America, The Warmth of Other Suns. October 18th, Charles C. Mann with his book about uh, 1493, everything that happened following Columbus's uh, bridging of the gap between the, the two uh, across the Atlantic Ocean, everything that happened ecologically. And November 1st, James Glick with the information. We have, we are hosting, or actually Aegon is sponsoring a reception right across the main hall. We invite all of you to join us and join Mr. Hamlish for a drink. Thank you very much, most of all, Marvin Hamlish, for your life, sharing us your life, your work, and your music, which is, as far as I can tell, all of a piece. Thank you. <laughs>